Dr. Galindo, really, we owe a great debt of thanks to because he, he started our program, really. He was the, uh, really essentially, uh, the, the first real interventional cardiologist at UCLA that started our program, and um, the Children's Heart Center of Nevada is lucky enough to have him there where he's doing wonderful things with uh, Dr. Rothman. Um, and again, Al has a very difficult task as well. In 15 minutes, he's got to tell us the role for, oh, well, he's doing a different talk. This is a better talk, I think. The role of stents in adult congenital heart disease. Okay, I don't, I don't really have any disclosures. I do have one major revelation that I made this morning, and that is that <clears throat> I now understand why I was recruited to UCLA. Um, you see, d uh, Dr. Rothman and I are part of an experiment. He and I are exactly the same age. He and I are both from Latin America. The only difference is that he got the treadmill in the office, <laughs> which makes me the control. <laughs> <laughs> All right, in any case, let me try to do this as quickly as I can. Uh, uh, the, uh, this talk is really about stents, uh, and there are various applications in adult congenital heart defects. Uh, I'm going to talk about bare metal stents, covered stents, and the valve stents I'm just going to make a mention of. That's actually the topic of the next uh, talk. Uh, bare metal stents is what we've had for a number of years now, since, uh, since the 90s. They are either balloon expandable or self-expanding. They come in a wide range of diameters and lengths. Uh, they are excellent for relieving obstructions or stenosis or to establish or maintain openings. Uh, in terms of adult congenital heart defects, the, ones, the areas where we would most be likely to apply stents uh, to relieve obstructions is in the pulmonary arteries in the setting of a tetralogy of Fallot or Fontaine. Uh, coarctation of the aorta, uh, the baffles within mustards or sennings, are no, some of them are notorious for having obstructions, pulmonary veins, or fontan conduits. And I'm just going to show you some examples of this. This is a patient with uh, Tetralogy Fallot that's been repaired, he has a stenosis here. You can see there's a clips here, which is a site of a previous Blalock tau shunt. A stent has been placed, and again, this is something that's been done now for uh, I don't know, uh, almost 20 years. Uh, this is a patient with a Fontan. This is a, a, a narrowing. This is not quite as dramatic as a previous picture, but in a Fontan, even small narrowings can make major differences in terms of hemodynamics. Uh, and this is uh, the same uh, uh, left pulmonary artery after stem placement. So these have been very effective for that. This is a patient. Uh, on the tail of the previous talk, uh, they said this uh, uh, individual had come to us, uh, to Vegas, had had a, a procedure done in a state neighboring Nevada that begins with a C, um, and they had used very aggressively coils to close the ductus, uh, but unfortunately what they'd created was a, an obstruction in the left pulmonary artery. Uh, and so this patient came to us, we assessed the patient had a significant gradient to the left pulmonary artery and we elected to use a stent in the proximal left pulmonary artery to, to relieve the obstruction that was caused by the massive coils. Uh, this is a patient with a, a coarctation of the aorta. This is a fairly severe coarctation. You can see all the, the um, arterial collaterals that this patient has been depending on for some of the flow to the descending aorta. Uh, in this patient, uh, uh, the, the obstruction was crossed, and an uncovered bare metal stent was placed. And I hope this, this becomes uh, not our usual practice anymore, because I'll, I'll show you later that I think that this is much better addressed by, or safer to address it with covered stents than bare metal stents. Uh, this is a, uh, an, an example of a patient with um, a, a Senning uh, who has the baffle obstruction. You can see a stent has already been placed in the uh, inferior vena cava to the left atrium baffle. Uh, patient has had heart block, has a pacemaker lead in, and now has a significant obstruction in this upper pathway. You can see that with this injection, a lot of blood fills the azagous vein back here. Um, the reason, even though the patient may not have uh, uh, SVC obstruction symptoms or, or signs, uh, the reason that you would want to maintain this open is that this will be the pathway for pacer leads in the future as well. Um, and so despite having a pacer lead in, a stent was placed. Uh, it does end up trapping the, the lead in there, but it allows you for um, 
uh, further access to that area from that route. Uh, we've also done uh, stents to relieve uh, pulmonary venous baffle obstructions. That's a little bit more tricky. I don't have any of those images, um, but uh, that one requires stent placed from retrograde through the aorta. Uh, this is a patient with a pulmonary vein obstruction. Pulmonary vein obstructions um, have been very tricky. Um, just dilating them often doesn't work, and often sometimes putting in stents doesn't work. But this is an example of a patient in whom a stent was placed in an uh, obstruction. Uh, in the left pulmonary vein and has resulted in long-term relief of the obstruction. I think the best setting is when it's a very discrete obstruction. Uh, and then finally, this is a, a patient. Um, we're finding more and more uh, patients uh, with Fontans uh, when we count them later in adulthood for a variety of reasons. Uh, we've found a few that have had some obstruction within their, their Fontan. Now, the, the gradient across this area is not very significant. This is under general anesthesia when the patient is laying down. Um, with activity, uh, without general anesthesia, this would probably represent even more of a, of a hemodynamic um, um, significantly obstruction. And the problem here is that this is all the venous drainage from the lower part of the body and from the liver. And we all know that uh, patients who've had um, Fontans Long-term, one of the things that we're particularly concerned about is their propensity to develop liver cirrhosis. So here, this is a, a large stent that was placed at that site, relieving the obstruction. Uh, this is a, um, an example of a stent, a bare metal stent that's used to create an opening. Um, this is a patient who's had a Fontan, uh, has unfavorable hemodynamics, uh, and in this setting, uh, we wanted to create an opening to uh, decompress the Fontan to some extent so that the, we would trade off high Fontan pressures for saturation. So in this, on this panel, there's, uh, you can see the flow coming up and there's no flow across the, the baffle. And then the, uh, the baffle has been perforated and a stent has been placed. And that did result in, in uh, pretty rapid improvement in the, in the patient's clinical condition. Long term, uh, this can be somewhat iffy, uh, creating uh, fenestrations in terms of whether it really will reverse things like the propensity to develop uh, cirrhosis. This is a patient we had not too long, well, some time ago in, um, in Vegas. A uh, patient had had a Fontan in Texas. Um, and this Fontan that was done uh, was the old st uh, style of Fontan with the uh, inferior vena cava, superior vena cava all dumped into the right atrium. And then there's, you can see a little bit of uh, calcification up here. There's a little bit of a, uh, uh, there's a pathway up to the pulmonary arteries. This is probably the least favorable um, hemodynamics. There's a lot of loss of energy as the SVC, IVC blood circulate and uh, twirl around in the atrium. Unfortunately, he had liver cirrhosis, he had tuberculosis, uh, and he had diabetes. He was a poor surgical candidate. He also had a large clot uh, within his fontan. Uh, and in this font particular fontan, what they did was they left the coronary sinus draining into the fontan circuit, which typically we don't do. Uh, so his coronary venous return was now exposed to the higher pressure Fontan pressures. So what we elected to do uh, was to create the uh, fenestration at the uh, coronary sinus. So what this, uh, this is a picture of uh, one catheter coming from below. Um, you can see a little bit of, of uh, contrast uh, that had been used to stain the, uh, the baffle in the atrium. Uh, transeptal puncture was performed, if you will, across the baffle, and this is the sheath across. And then a catheter from the internal jugular is coming down. It's pointing back up to the roof of the coronary sinus, and that uh, little wire there is a radio frequency wire, and that was used to perforate. With that, we did the flossing that, uh, that uh, Dan told us about. Uh, so we created a, a venous venous wire loop. Uh, this is from femoral vein to internal jugular vein. And right here is the stent that's going to be placed. And it's placed across the, the roof. And once it's placed, you can see the stent sitting right here, and it acts like a little chimney. And it, it, it served to decompress a little bit the, um, the, um, the coronary sinus. At a subsequent catheterization, we dilated it even further. So we traded uh, saturations for, uh, for improved coronary venous return and for a little bit of decompression of the Fontan pressures. <clears throat> Uh, the, the, the major step or the major advance, I think, uh, that we have been denied in this country because we don't have access to many of these covered stents, 
um, is the, the use of covered stents. Uh, we've had to make some on our own using Gore-Tex graphs and sewing them onto stents. Uh, there are some balloon expandable stents that have been created for other purposes that we've used uh, uh, in pediatrics uh, and uh, <clears throat> some self-expanding stents. Uh, these are examples. This is uh, a Gore uh, system for aortic aneurysms, and we've used this portion of it, which is the extender, um, for uh, in some settings <clears throat> to create a, 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 an impermeable communication. Uh, this is the CP stent uh, without the covering, and this is with the covering. These are not available to us except on a trial basis in the United States. Uh, they are available just about everywhere else. Uh, and this is one that hopefully will be coming out soon. It's a, a, a awaiting uh, FDA approval. This is by a company called Atrium. Uh, these are large. These will be large uh, diameter stents. Uh, they can, I, can, I believe they come mounted up to 60 millimeters, and you can re-expand them further beyond that. Um, in terms of the applications, um, stents, covered stents can be used uh, either for aneurysm or rupture prevention or management. Uh, in that setting, it's a coarctation, which I alluded to earlier. Uh, sometimes in placing melody valves, uh, these very calcified right ventricle to pulmonary artery uh, conduits can uh, fracture and there can be uh, hemorrhage. So this is another setting where you would want to put a covered stent in, although the melody valve itself is a covered stent. Uh, in some settings of pulmonary arteries uh, to prevent uh, rupture or, or to treat an aneurysm. In some settings, we want to use covered stents to close communications. They can be used to seal surgical shunts, such as uh, uh, blaylock taussig shunts or Waterston shunts. Uh, they can be used to uh, close Fontan leaks or the, uh, the famous Thebesian veins. I'll show you an example of that. Uh, or to close Fontan fenestrations. And I think this is an area that, that is particularly attractive, um, and I'll, I'll show you why. Uh, they can also be used to create impermeable communications, and there's a tremendous amount of interest in doing non-surgical fontans or fontan completions. Um, there are some problems with that, and I don't know if it'll ever come to fruition unless it's a hybrid type approach. Uh, and also, covered stents uh, have the advantage that it prevents intimal growth. In, in settings where there's a lot of intimal uh, development, like in collaterals, uh, they, these may have more of application. This is a covered stent to treat an aneurysm. A patient had had a coarctation, had had an angioplasty, developed an aneurysm, and this is a, a covered stent that uh, excludes the aneurysm and treats that. That's no, no, not terribly different than the concept behind, behind aortic aneurysms. Um, this is a patient with a very severe coarctation. This is, almost looks interrupted, but there is a little communication across this. Uh, in, two, in two steps, uh, uh, the, the obstruction was crossed and a covered stent was placed, and a subsequent catheterization, this was dilated even further. You can imagine that uh, without the covering, to try to dilate this to this diameter would stretch whatever little tissue there is there uh, excessively, and there's a uh, risk of rupture or aneurysm formation. Uh, this is one in which a covered stent is used to treat an uh, aneurysm in a pulmonary artery uh, and uh, relieve that. And this is a, an example of a covered stent um, to close a water stent shunt. Uh, this is an injection into the aorta, and you can see contrast of uh, filling the pulmonary artery. And uh, <clears throat> this is an injection to the pulmonary artery. You can see the area of stenosis, which is where the, st uh, the shunt uh, is anast most. And this is after the covered stent uh, relieves the obstruction, and on the aortic injection, there's no further flow across to that um, pulmonary artery. This is a, a patient uh, who had a Fontan, low saturations, was found to have a whole network of little uh, venous connections from the Fontan to the atrium. And I'm sure we, we've all seen examples of this. Um, <clears throat> this is the, the um, Gore uh, aortic extender, that the, the picture I showed you earlier. This is a self-expanding um, stent covered with um, um, PTFE. And it's being positioned uh, at the site where the obstruction, with, where the um, little venous connections are. Uh, there's a little bit of a narrowing here, and our hope also is to relieve that. Uh, this is after the stent has been released. It's released by pulling a little uh, sort of rip cord, and it allows the stent to uh, to uh, achieve its full expansion. And then it's post dilated, and this is the picture afterwards. So that, this is a setting where where that can be used. Uh, and this is something that I find that may be more of an application once these covered stents become available. 
This is a patient, um, we did this one in Panama. Uh, this is a Fontan, there's a, um, a fenestration that's been created. It's a little bit unusual, it's much higher than where we usually see fenestrations. Uh, you can see the contrast then flowing into the branch pulmonarities, but there's a significant amount of flow across the fenestration to the atria. Uh, we test occluded it with balloon like we usually do. The pressures did not rise significantly. The saturations increased. Um, and we elected in this case to use a covered stent. So this is a, the, one of the atrium uh, large diameter covered stents. And what I find particularly attractive about this is that the fenestration is about at this level. If in the future we need to re-enter, um, uh, it would be relatively easy to perforate across the, the covered stent and re-establish a communication to the atrium uh, should there be a need for a fenestration, uh, perhaps even smaller than the original one. And if we anticipate at the time of surgery, if the surgeon can mark the site of the fenestration, that will make that job much easier to uh, find the fenestration at subsequent time. And this is an example of using covered stents to create communications or fontan completion. This is like the holy grail right now of interventional cath. Uh, these patients, uh, in this, in this, this is not one that we did. This is a, a pulmonary artery that's been prepared. Um, they come by, they, they puncture and make a connection across. They put a covered stent. The problem here is at this level, really. I mean, this stent does, the, the uh, struts do cr cross over the lumen of the pulmonary arteries, but the major problem is, is down here, and this is what is the most limiting factor, and that is that um, if the covering goes all the way down, then you might ex exclude some of the hepatic veins. If there's not enough covering, then you're going to have leaking across that area. Uh, so it's, it's very difficult to, to achieve that. And then this is uh, the second to last slide, uh, just to mention that uh, valves that we're delivering now percutaneously uh, are stents, <clears throat> and uh, this is the Melody valve that uh, we've all been using. Uh, the Sapien valve, um, it's a little bit different. It comes a little bit larger size, up to 26 millimeters. Uh, it's a little bit shorter um, in terms of the, 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 the stent itself. Uh, it's made out of bovine pericardial tissue, uh, and the, adva the one advantage of this is that um, it is, it is the, what's being used for the aortic position, but we can now apply it um, at other settings if it's being used in your center. And then in terms of future directions <clears throat> uh, for stents, uh, I think there's still more, much more to be uh, done in terms of hybrid approaches, uh, either to Fontan completions, uh, in the setting of pulmonary atresia VSD uh, to establish communications between the right ventricle and the central pulmonary arteries, um, and use of valve stents in either as a primary repair as opposed to just relieving uh, uh, either relieving obstructions or creating a, or placing a valve where surgery has been done previously. Uh, valve stents could be placed in within a stent uh, in children, and then as they grow, you can gradually expand them. Uh, putting valve stents in the branch pulmonarities as opposed to the right ventricular outflow tract, or the use of bifurcated stents. That's it.